least 400 to 500 Americans are there. Maybe 20 or so people have gone through. Joining me now, Ilian Levy, Israeli government spokesperson. Uh, thank you for giving us some time. I know you're very busy. The IDF has been pushing forward in this ground invasion. We've seen the attack targeting the Hamas leader at this refugee camp. How much warning did civilians have before this airstrike at the camp? Two and a half weeks. It's been two and a half weeks since Israel warned the residents of northern Gaza to get out of harm's way for their own safety. And the reason we did that is because northern Gaza is where Hamas, uh, which of course perpetrated the October 7th massacre, has embedded most of its infrastructure. It's where that whole network of tunnels called the Gaza Metro is located under people's homes, under schools. The Al Shifa hospital is where Hamas keeps its main command bunker in the basement of the hospital. So we gave civilians two and a half weeks notice to get out of the way temporarily for their own safety. By the way, most of them have. Of the 1.1 million residents of northern Gaza, 800,000 have already fled south for their safety. And we hope that others will also move south temporarily for their safety. It's not a long distance. It's about 10 miles at most because we're going after Hamas. We're going after the whole of the Hamas infrastructure responsible for the October 7th massacre. We don't want to see people being hurt. You know, I have to say from a military perspective, we've clearly surrendered the element of surprise that we would have had if we hadn't given civilians that much notice to leave. But it's important for us that no more civilians get hurt. So we're giving them ample notice to leave and we're reaffirming our call. Civilians should get out of harm's way. This is a war against Hamas. Hamas, which declared war on us with October 7th. We're fighting back at them, not the people of Gaza. Do you have an estimate on how many civilians were there and, and were killed? I can't speak to specific numbers, but what happened yesterday, it appears, is that the IDF struck a tunnel network located underneath Jabalia. The airstrike went between the buildings. But because that tunnel network extended underneath people's homes, uh, that had rendered them structurally unsafe. And so those buildings suffered damage because Hamas had decided to store explosives underneath people's homes, clearly in grave violation of international law, not that the terror organization that two and a half weeks ago burned, beheaded, butchered, raped, tortured, and mutilated 1,400 Israeli civilians cares about international law, but it's important to be uh, clear on that. And we hold Hamas solely accountable and responsible for all the horrific humanitarian suffering inside the Gaza Strip. It's why, again, we reaffirm our call for civilians to get out of harm's way. We don't want them to get hurt. We're going after Hamas and Hamas alone. Many of those civilians who have been able to move to the South, some are American dual citizenship, uh, who are in the South, are trying to get through the Rafa crossing. We've seen some people be able to get through. We know Qatar, Egypt, and the U.S. are involved in, in that. What is Israel's role in helping to allow people to pass through Rafa to the South in Egypt? We want all the foreign nationals in Gaza to be safe. By the way, the Israeli hostages in Gaza are also foreign nationals. The 240 innocent people who were abducted from their homes on October 7th, we want to get them out as well. And cynically, Hamas has been stopping people inside Gaza from getting out. We heard just from the national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, a few days ago, talking of, I think it was 600 uh, people with American passports who Hamas was stopping from getting out. Uh, and we hope that Hamas will will no longer use foreign nationals in Gaza as hostages and will allow them to reach safety. Uh, speaking of the hostages, there have been some reports here in the last couple of hours that Hamas may release more hostages. Is there any truth to that? What are you hearing? We're not going to respond to Hamas's campaign of psychological warfare against the Israeli people. Let's remember, these people were abducted after their families were massacred and slaughtered inside Israel. And Hamas is continuing in its efforts to traumatize everyone in Israel. Our approach is that only pressure is going to force Hamas to release the hostages. Diplomatic pressure and military pressure. We had four hostages released because of international diplomatic pressure. Another who was rescued by IDF forces, clearly standing to one side and asking Hamas to be nice and release these people was never an option. And our assessment is this ground offensive is going to be creating the conditions to advance that goal of getting our hostages safe and bringing them home to their families. And part of that equation, Qatar, has been an important player in the release of some hostages. Operating, though, a base and bank for Hamas within Qatar is a concern. They've helped mediate some of the hostages' releases. But healthy skepticism of Qatar must be applied here. What is your view on Qatar's role? 
I'm not going to get into discussions of the negotiations that may be happening to release the hostages. Clearly, that is a very sensitive subject. Uh, but we've been very clear. Hamas proved itself on October 7th to be worse than ISIS with the atrocities that it committed and live streamed, by the way, on its own social media and sometimes on its victims' own social media. And the whole world must close ranks against Hamas just as it closed ranks against ISIS. No country in the world would have had diplomatic relations with ISIS, would have given it shelter. No country in the world would uh, should give shelter to Hamas. And we think that the whole world should impose very strict sanctions on any country that continues to shield the masterminds of the October 7th massacre. What else are you hearing from the front lines? I spoke with the deputy mayor of Jerusalem in our last hour, and she talked about the young men and women, some as young as 19, who are fighting on the front lines for Israel. What is coming back to you in terms of morale from, from your troops? You know, it's very different perhaps from wars that America has fought where its troops are thousands of miles across uh, the sea and the professional soldiers. We're talking about conscripts aged 18, 19, who've literally just finished high school and being sent into battle and also reservists. Many friends of mine, Tel Aviv is a ghost town because so many people have been plucked out of their ordinary lives and sent down south or up north in order to defend our people. Clearly, no one wants to be in this situation. Everyone wants their lives back. But people in Israel really are united with a very strong sense of justice and understanding that Hamas has to go, that after round after round after round of conflict, we can't go back to a world in which Hamas can invade and slaughter our people at will, that really Hamas has to be destroyed now. That's something that unites everyone across Israeli society. And so I know that the men and women on the front are clearly anxious about what is coming ahead, but have a very firm sense of resolve that Really, the lines between good and evil uh, have never been clearer, and we're on the side of the good. We're on the side of the light, and we're on the side of humanity and civilization here. Elon Levy, thank you. Thank you. Turning now.